it's great to be with you today. Uh, my name is Pete Wood. If I haven't met you before, it's great to have you with us. We are in the last week of uh, our series called Life in Jesus' Name. That is in John's Gospel. And today we are looking at chapter 12 in John. I want to encourage you to have that open in front of you. We're looking at uh, verses 1 to 19. We've just read through them. And uh, right at the beginning of the passage, we are told this. Six days before the Passover. So the events that happen in this passage, in fact, happen just six days before Jesus' death. And that puts everything into context. The, uh, the tension, the, uh, the, the authorities and their dislike and their resistance against Jesus. Very many things that are happening all happen in the context of Jesus' death being not very far away. Today we're going to be looking at the, the two events in these verses. Firstly, a party. And then secondly, the parade or the, uh, the triumphal entry that we hear about Jesus. Before we do that, though, I want to show you a picture of some fish. Now, I wonder if you know what sort of fish they are. When I tell you, I know you're going to have a reaction. In fact, the fish on there were anchovies. Now, at this point, uh, if you're like me, you're going to say, fantastic, anchovies are amazing. I love to put them on my pizza. Uh, I love them in a Caesar salad. They're great for all sorts of other things. Or it could be different than me. Your reaction could be very different. In fact, the anchovy effect for you might be to say, get that disgusting, salty, slimy thing away from me. I want it, no part of it in any of my food. And that's totally okay. Different people react to different things in different sorts of ways. And today what I want to do is to examine the reactions that we find against Jesus in these verses, in these two different events. The first of them is the party. Well, Jesus was famous for uh, being at parties with all sorts of people, banquets. Uh, this is no different in some sorts of ways. It's, uh, it's thrown in his honour. Lazarus, who uh, James talked to us about last week, having been raised from the dead, was also at this banquet. And there's all sorts of different people there. But the people that the, the Gospel uh, writer John tells us principally about, uh, and their reactions are these three people, Martha, Mary, and Judas Iscariot. We're also going to talk about the, um, the chief priests a little later, but let's, uh, let's talk about these three characters. Well, first of all, we hear about Martha. Martha in this passage, I guess, characteristically is being that uh, servant-hearted and faithful follower of Jesus. She continues to serve throughout the party. But the really interesting thing happens uh, on the part of Mary. And this is Mary of Bethany, uh, that is Lazarus and Martha's sister, and not to be confused with um, Mary Magdalene, who's often sort of co-opted into this story, but uh, doesn't really seem to be a part of it. Mary does a very unique thing, and that's why John records this. She takes, well, it seems like a litre of very expensive perfume. She pours it out onto Jesus' feet in the midst of the party as, as he sort of lays back on the ground, his feet behind him, she, she comes up uh, uninvited and does this. And it's, a, it's an odd event where, you know, I don't know about you, I don't particularly like having my feet touched by other people. Uh, in Jesus' culture, people were used to having their feet washed, but this is a, a very unique way of doing it. But Mary is doing something, well, outrageous, you might say. She is, in fact, pouring out an enormous amount of money on Jesus' feet. She willingly, in fact, pours out $40,000 on Jesus' feet. $40,000 worth of perfume. And that in itself, you, you have to kind of stand back and take a deep breath and try to analyse what she's doing there, because it's odd. But more than that, she then begins to wipe his feet with her hair. And wiping them with her hair, beyond just being, well, grubby and kind of filthy, was scandalous. There's a reason for that, and that is because in Numbers 5, 11 to 22, uh, this is a passage, passage that talks about women being unfaithful to their husbands. There's a sort of inference that the way that women display their hair 
uh, displays their unfaithfulness in some way. And so the tradition of Jewish women in Jesus' time and up until now, in fact, is that they cover their hair and that only their husbands see their hair. So by, Je- by, by Mary um, letting her hair down in the first place, that's a sort of you know, cultural no-no, but then to wipe Jesus' feet with it is downright scandalous. There's this sort of overtones there of impurity and things like that. In fact, what Mary is doing is an act of absolute devotion. It's striking, really. And as I, as I sort of read this and analysed it and thought about it and reflected on it for myself, I had to ask myself, and I wonder whether you would do the same, how devoted are you to Jesus? Are you as devoted as Mary is? I, I kind of struggled with this, and I'll tell you why. I think in our sort of middle-class Sydney culture, uh, we like to think of ourselves in certain sorts of ways. We like to think of ourselves as being reasonable, as, as being sensible. We like to self think of ourselves as being logical and, of course, being careful with the things that we have, uh, the things that we do, the things that we say. I think these would characterise the way that our church culture works as well. We're reasonable, sensible, logical, careful people. But Mary's acts in her day and even ours don't feel like that. Mary's acts feel rash. Uh, To to pour out a litre of perfume onto a, a man's feet is, you know, Uninvited, it seems rash. Uh, it seems wasteful. I mean, if this was a family heirloom and, or something that was part of her dowry, how could she do that? It, it seems an emotional thing to do. You know, she's sort of expressing her emotions in a way that, well, frankly, it's sort of uncomfortable for us to encounter. And of course, it seems careless given, given her reputation and maybe the. Uh, the things that could be said about her afterwards. But again, it, it made me ask myself this question. And I reckon it should do for, for most of us, and that is, have you poured out the most precious things you own for Jesus' glory? Have you poured out the most precious things you own for Jesus' glory? Or are you willing to do that? Because I don't know that we always think about things in that way, do we? We like to hold on to, for instance, various things like our pride. If I was to do something like what Mary did, I would completely debase myself. If I was to do something like what she did with such a valuable commodity, I'd have to be giving up my money. And, of course, then there is my reputation. I mean, what would people say about me if I was to devote myself to Jesus in such an amazing way, in such a public and unique sort of way that made it clear to everyone that I was absolutely devoted to him? I don't know how, for instance, my friends and family would come at me throwing $40,000 away in an attempt to glorify Jesus. And which brings us to the the next reaction that we we find, and that is that of Judas Iscariot. Judas says, why wasn't this perfume sold? And the money given to the poor, it was worth a year's wages, and he's right, a year's wages for a labourer at that time. Now, to our ears, to a lot of people's ears, one might be tempted to agree. One might be tempted to think that Mary has been, well, rash. She, she's been wasteful with this valuable thing. That she's been emotional in a way that is not helpful and that she has been careless. And yet John talks us through this passage, talks us through Judas' heart, and we find out in fact that Judas' heart is not what we think 
It is not as we might think is appropriate, but rather he is deceitful. He's selfish. He, uh, you know, he's following Jesus around, but really he's enjoying the perks. He's able to cream a little bit of cash off here and there to do things that he enjoys. And in the end, because of this attitude, because of the contents of his heart, because of his lack of devotion, he is at odds with Jesus. Um, And I think it's worth thinking through that for a minute. I mean, we can be part of Jesus' entourage, if we want to call it that, for all sorts of different reasons. We might like the company. We might enjoy the food. We might be privy to some of the, well, perks of being part of the church. But is that because we actually follow Jesus? Or is that because there's something in it for us? And if it's just because it's something in it for us, then in the end we find ourselves at odds with Jesus. And we want to be careful of that. Every church that I've been a part of, there have been people in that church that seem to be in that category. And if you are one of those people, I want you to rethink your relationship with Jesus. Are you part of his people for yourself? Or are you part of his people for him? Well, let's move on to the second event that we look at today, and that is the parade. This is a a unique situation. I mean, we have parades in our day and age when people are uh, offered uh, glory for all sorts of things from, you know, serving in the military to uh, sporting victories. In the midst of the parade that we find today, uh, various people are reacting to Jesus in all sorts of different ways. We're going to talk about three different groups of people in the context of this parade and their reactions to Jesus. Uh, The crowd is the first of them, but also the disciples and then lastly the Pharisees. Let's talk about the crowd. Jesus is coming from Bethany over the Mount of Olives to, uh, to Jerusalem. And Jesus has such a strong following that we're told uh, in verses 12 and 13 that a crowd comes to meet him. And as they come to meet him, they've, they've got palm branches. They're crying things out. They're crying out, Hosanna. They're crying out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And, uh, you know, we w- might be wondering, well, what's going on there? Like, what's, what's happening that they would be saying these things? And, of course, there is some Old Testament context to this. So, as in the uh, Festival of Booths, people would sing uh, Psalms 100 and... Uh, 15 through to 118. The psalm that they are quoting from is from 118. This is the thing they are celebrating. As they cry out, Hosanna, they're actually crying out, Lord, save us. And then they're quoting from verse 26, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, that's pretty cool, isn't it? You know, that's a nice thing to hear. They like Jesus. They recognise that he comes from God. And then they say something else that is actually a lot edgier. They say, blessed is the king of Israel. Now, this is where we start to get into trouble. This is why, for instance, Jesus, uh, as we spoke about before Easter when we looked at Luke's uh, rendering of these events, this is why Jesus comes in on a donkey. Because if he was to come in on a war horse, it would, it would contribute to the, the political, to the, to the grassroots movement that we see at work here. And there's some, there's some other tips to us about this. One of them is the palm branches. We know uh, from other places that palm branches were a national symbol for Israel at the time. And when I say national, I mean nationalist as well. Uh, Don Carson tells us that from about two centuries earlier, palm branches already became a national symbol. When Simon Maccabee drove the Syrian forces out of the Jerusalem citadel, he was fated with music and waving of palm branches. So this is what's going on. There's a national expectation. There's a political reality and expectation going on with what these people are doing. They're saying, 
Jesus, save us. Jesus, God has sent you. You are our new king. But the branches that they're waving sort of have a... There's a, there's a sort of darker indicator as to what's going on. We might compare it, for instance, to uh, Southern Cross tattoos as, uh, as had by many guys who went to the Cronulla riots. What in fact the crowd are saying is, save us from the Romans. And this is the part where we, we want to stop and reflect a little bit again. Because Jesus clearly is there to save. He clearly has come uh, to save God's people. But the people in Jerusalem, their expectation of what Jesus will save them from actually is not part of God's plan. And I think that as Christians in a middle class culture where we're taught and learnt and imbibe various things, that we have ex expectations about what we need to be saved from, but they're not necessarily part of God's plan for us. I wanted to uh, think about some of those. So, for instance, I think people in our culture would like to be saved from discomfort. You know, we want to live the good life, the life of ease, where things are fun and, you know, it's a good thing. But Jesus doesn't actually ever promise to save us from discomfort in this life. We might want to be part of, you know, the world and the culture that it is. We, we might want to be accepted. We might want to be saved from rejection. But there again, Jesus never promises to save us from rejection in this life, but rather he promises us that if we follow him, if we are devoted to him, then we will be rejected just as he was. And then, of course, there is the kind of myths and legends in our society of hopes and dreams. Now, what is the kind of dream that you have for your life, your, uh, your career, your family, your hobby, uh, your passion? That we ought to follow that. And sometimes I think that people are thinking that Jesus ought to save them from broken dreams. But there again, that is not something that Jesus ever promises to save us from. He promises to save us from our broken relationship with God, from the consequences of our sins and rebellion against him so that we can be in relationship with God again, so that we can be part of God's kingdom. And of course, Jesus does this by his work on the cross. And we need to be very careful that we don't veer off in thinking that Jesus is here to save us from these things any more than he was there to save Israelites from the Romans. Well, let's think about the next group of people that react to Jesus, and that is his disciples. They're watching uh, all of this parade happening. They're watching and listening to the things that people are saying, and it tells us that they just don't understand. They don't understand. John says, at first his disciples did not understand all this. They're, they're perplexed and confused. They're unsure of what Jesus is doing. They themselves can't see God's plan in detail. I guess I want to say to you that if you find yourself in this position, that that is okay. It's okay to be devoted to Jesus, to follow him and love him, but not be quite sure what he's doing in your life or in the world at this time. I think a lot of us find ourselves in this situation at the moment. John tells us in the next verse, from what we just looked at, uh, verse 17, that actually later on the disciples did understand that the Holy Spirit offered them a, a kind of fruition and an understanding of what God was doing in each of these situations that helped them to see that Jesus was fulfilling prophecies from the Old Testament. But that doesn't mean to say that we're always going to understand, we don't need to, and that doesn't make it blind faith either. We can trust Jesus based on what we already know and know that he's continuing to look after us and love us. Let's talk about the, uh, the last group of people and I, I want to kind of lump the, uh, the Pharisees and the chief priests into this. In verses 10 and 11 we're told that the chief priests have now made plans not just to kill Jesus but to kill Lazarus as well because Jesus has become such an issue. He's become such a problem. His presence in Jewish society is causing so many issues. 
Similarly, uh, in verse 19, the, uh, the Pharisees say, we're getting nowhere, the whole world has gone after him. Now, I, I guess this situation is a, is a mirror of many people in the world today. There are some who would say, I guess much like the, uh, the chief priests and Pharisees, that Jesus is not the way, that, uh, that there are other uh, beliefs or faiths that are the right way. But in our society, I think the more clear picture that we get is something like this. Keep your religion to yourself. We don't want Jesus in the marketplace. We don't want him in the political sphere. We don't want him in schools. We certainly don't want him in our private lives. Take him out. Get rid of him. Many of us have been in that situation. And I guess the good news is that we know that Jesus came for precisely these people. Well, I guess overall then, from this passage, what we see is, well, what I would call the anchovy effect. Different people have different reactions to Jesus. Some are saying yes, but some are saying no. And all of us fall between this one way or the other. Our decision matters. The way that we respond to Jesus matters. Now, there may be some uh, who are listening today who are thinking, well, you know, God takes care of that. And certainly people like John Calvin talked about God's uh, role in, in saving us. As he talked about unconditional election, that God, you know, chooses who gets in and who doesn't. And, and that, you know, if God offers us grace, then we're not able to refuse it. But it's not as clear cut as that. In fact, when I was at Bible College, uh, one of my fellow students asked uh, the then principal, uh, Archbishop Peter Jensen, how do people become Christians? What is God's role in it? What is our role in it? Peter Jensen said this. He said, it's 100% God and 100% us. We are called to God and he asks us, to respond to his son. He asks us to respond to Jesus because Jesus has done, done something significant for us. And in this passage, he, uh, he even gives a hint to that as he, uh, as he reprimands Judas. He says, you will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Jesus is saying to Judas, I'm going to do something significant. And we know that in fact, the significant thing he was choosing to do as he left them was to pay for their sins and for ours so that we might be right with God again. I wonder how today leaves you as you consider these people. Which, uh, which side of the equation are you on? Are you devoted to Jesus? Uh, are you following him? Do you love him and listen to him each day? Or are you still on the other side where you're saying, no, actually, I... I want no part of it, or you're still sorting it out. Well, if you're somebody who's fallen short of following him, like I have many, many times, then I, or you're somebody who's looking to him for the first time, I want to offer you an encouragement. It comes from Lamentations, chapter 3. It's a great encouragement. All of us who, uh, who seek to follow him, we, uh, we are offered this. Those of us who are yet to follow him are offered this as well. It says, because of the God of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They're new every morning. Every day, God gives us a new opportunity in Jesus to come back to him. And I want to encourage you to take that up. I hope you've enjoyed this series in John, and uh, I look forward to seeing you next week.